Hey, Slosh. It's good to be here in Helsinki. My name is Alex Mameni. I'm a partner at General Catalyst. For those that don't know us, uh, we are a global investment and transformation company. And you know, we focus on partnering with the very best founders around the world who are trying to build global resilience. That means you know, making the critical industries in our economy, our society, more resilient. Um, and one of the folks that we've been lucky to partner with is Robin that's here. Robin, it's your first slush. Welcome. How's it gone so far? Uh, intense. I'm super tired. And uh, <laughs> now I have to sit on this rotating stage. So it's been productive. Um, so, you know, Robin is going to be too humble to say this himself. So I'm just going to uh, flatter him, flatter his ego here for a bit. Um, if you go on Hugging Face today and you actually look at what the three most popular models are, you will find out that Robin has won gold, he's won silver, and he's won bronze. So the three top models have been built by him and his team. Uh, you know, Stable Diffusion, uh, you know, uh, which he's the co-author on and co-creator -co of, has been downloaded hundreds of millions of times. And you've now started Black Forest, where you recently released Flux, which has really taken the world by storm. But, you know, before we dive into all that, Let's just take a step back and go back to the origin story. How did we get here? Right. Um, yeah, initially I didn't. I, I actually didn't really like programming at all. Um, I started studying physics and was like really into theoretical physics, and um, then kind of discovered there are like simulations, there are like uh, pattern formation. Actually, yeah, observing the stuff that you can describe with physics. Um, through simulations, I found super interesting and kind of like, yeah, got into learning Python, C++, all of these things. And uh, through that, took some courses in uh, pattern formation, in nonlinear dynamics, stochastic dynamics. It's kind of all the stuff that's now um, combined in the concept of diffusion models. So, uh, yeah, and at the university, we had like two tiny groups who were uh, focusing on generative, or more general, like on AI models. And there was a few people in that group that actually focused on generative models. And um, one of them, uh, Patrick, ended up being my master thesis supervisor and uh, later like, a co-founder of the company. And we started working together in this tiny lab in the University of Heidelberg in Germany like super resource constrained. Um, as you know, uh, deep learning models, they needed a ton of GPUs. Uh, we had like a few tiny ones. And um, I don't know, for some reason, we wanted to compete with the state of the art models that existed. Back in the day, it was uh, called Big GAN. Uh, there was also Style GAN, which is actually from Helsinki. Um, and yeah, like models made at large institutions like Google and NVIDIA. And it was like, with like constrained resources, that's uh, kind of ha tough to do. And this really forced us into this efficiency thinking, um, which kind of led to this development of uh, what's now known as latent generative models. So um, basic idea is that you, when you want to generate content, visual content, um, you don't have to generate everything because there's a lot of imperceptible details in the data. It's kind of the reason why image compression works. And um, you can leverage that fact if you compress these imperceptible details away into like a more abstract representation, and then you actually train a generative model on that. And yeah, we, we played a bunch with this and uh, developed a framework around this and yeah, took it further. Um, Scaled it up. Uh, stable diffusion was like one instance in the meantime, and um, now we are here. Yeah, and talk to us a little bit about you know, you mentioned you started really in like the excellence of European academia, right? And you started there as a researcher, living in a world of resource constraint, and you evolved from there to you know your role at Stable Diffusion with Patrick and a number of others, and released these models, um, you know. Uh, that were very novel at the time. And today, you know, you're the founder of one of the most exciting, you know, companies here in Europe, out of the Black Forest. Talk to us a little bit about that journey from being a researcher to a founder. You know, what were some of the things that 
you and Patrick and others had to learn along the way that were perhaps unintuitive? Mm. Were there things that, you know, habits that you had to unlearn as well as, as you kind of went through that journey? Right. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's like really about unlearning, but first of all, there's a lot of additional stuff we have to learn. Um, I don't know, as a, as a researcher, you, know, you publish papers, you're trained to publish papers. As a PhD student, you have to do that in order to get your PhD at some point. So you really try to maximize, um, I don't know, certain benchmark scores that get you an acceptance at a conference. Um, which can be a helpful target, because obviously it kind of helped the model development. Um, but at the same time, like, um, I, and that's like a debate we have now in the company um, quite a bit, like me and my co-founders, is that do we still keep chasing benchmarks? Of course, it's nice to be like on, like on certain leaderboards, rank one, or do we actually focus on building a product that works, but it might not be like the, um, on, on rank one? And there's like, I think, there's a little bit of truth to focusing on a product and prioritizing that, but then at the same time, I think it really is really helpful if you actually um, yeah, want to achieve the best model. And uh, I don't know. It's, so I, I think actually keeping some of that researcher mindset is helpful. Um, but of course, you have to be like uh, always considering like what is it actually that you're chasing, what's the benchmark actually. And um, yeah, and, and then there's a lot of other stuff that we have to learn. Um, from like in a research product, a project, you, you basically make a draft for something. You, you demonstrate that it works and it might only work at a small scale, but then you want to, if you want to build like a giant of model that is used by millions of people, it has to work at a very large scale. So, uh, and you have to scale it up and that really requires a different um, kind of engineering approach you need. Um, you really need to focus on the data pre-processing, on building like a scalable infrastructure where you train a large model, um, and these kind of things you don't really need to do when you're just like a single uh, PhD student. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to think that you know you started really as a scientist and a science company, and over time you've sort of evolved into figuring out what all these tricky pieces of infrastructure that are needed to be built to then be able to serve a product to end customers that are so easy to use and so delightful and, and amazing and make people dream. Um, you know, one of the things when we met that I think really struck me and that, you know, we really at General Callus admire you for is um, you very early on uh, said that you wanted to build a global technology company out of Europe with open source at the core and you wanted to do it outside of a black forest. And in fact, um, I'm sure there's investors here in the crowd who know that you know, for every investor meeting, you actually uh, ask them to come to Freiburg so that they can actually you know, feel um, what the black forest feels like for themselves uh, and maybe you know, experience the Grimm Brothers black forest tales <laughs> a bit more natively, as we've discussed. Um, you, know, you have spent most of your career putting out open models and I think that's been a very deliberate choice on your part. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about your core philosophy behind this. Like, why does this actually matter to you? Right. And uh, actually, uh, to the first point, I think there were like le never that many uh, investors in the Black Forest, so it's kind of an interesting time right now. <laughs> um, but but yeah, um, to to the open source, and I think it's a fairly general point that, that doesn't only apply to our models so that we do. Um, it also applies to, I don't know, language models, vision language models, um, all of the interesting stuff like Llama. And I think there's a bunch of reasons why open source is actually super attractive to foster research, to really drive research. Um, I think one of the key reasons why we actually see all of this innovation in AI, this, that so much of, this, uh, of these tools and of this technology is openly available as frameworks like PyTorch, um, and uh, CUDA, for example, on which all of this is being built currently. There's um, also this whole other perspective of you have some very powerful open source models like Llama, for example, and then a bunch of startups actually develop um, around this and then build technology on top of these models. And that's something that, I don't know, I think can really be like a an advantage of a place like Europe, for example, because 
I think nine out of the ten uh, mo uh, most popular models on Hugging Face, which are like open source models, um, come out of Europe originally. And that's, I, I don't think that's coincidence. Um, and uh, actually realizing this advantage of, of having this really like, powerful community here um, and fostering this ecosystem to uh, really help develop building more startups around it is, I think, something that, yeah, I don't know, I personally really like. And then, of course, there's like four specific models. There's the research, the innovation, it's like they're more transparent. You probably have like more uh, data privacy if, when, you, when you're able to run these models locally. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, it's also like if you actually, as a company, open source um, models, it can actually be a foundation for a good business model and it also attracts more talent because a lot of like researchers, they want to open source their stuff, they want to publish the work that they've been doing. Yeah, let's actually talk a little bit about that. So there's a lot of investors and actually people in general who are very skeptical around you know, being able to build a business around open source. Folks you know, admire the mission and they think that you know, it's wonderful that some of the very best models out there are being open source and distributed widely. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you're actually thinking about building a sustainable, scalable business model for Black Forest today? And you know, maybe talk a little bit about Flux when you... Yeah, um, so Flux is this text-to-image model that we put out in August. Um, was our first model that we released. And uh, yeah, it's currently, uh, I think, one of the best uh, text-to-image models that exist. And we put out different versions. We put out a fully um, open source version, Apache 2.0. Um, we put out a version that comes with a custom license that basically um, prohibits uh, commercial use, but allows non-commercial use. So the weights are available, the inference code is available on GitHub. And that's kind of irritating. Um, and uh, the third one is uh, a, a version that we basically published through our API. It's a proprietary version and it's the base version for the other two. It's the most powerful one, it's like the most flexible one. And that one we, um, that one we, we offer, um, as I said, in the API and uh, uh, you obviously then have to pay to use that. And then I think the interesting part about the open source approach is that these intermediate versions that I talked about they really drive this whole ecosystem. There's, being a, there's a lot of tools being built on top of them. We actually can take back um, into the development of our own models, um, innovations that are being built on top of the open models. And then actually for customers of ours that license our weights, it's also interesting because, because once they have licensed our weights, um, weights and the model, they can actually also use the innovation that's happening in the ecosystem, which I think is a really nice value proposition. And we are already seeing that um, playing out quite nicely. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how that's also driving product differentiation for you at Black Forest? So the, the fact that you're open sourcing, that you're seeing feedback from the community, that you know, folks are posting on Twitter, that some of your customers that you license weights to can, can work with the weights natively. How is this actually making you better as a product company as well? Yeah, as I said, like one, one key uh, thing that we're already doing is we can basically observe uh, the space and uh, of course that re requires some resources, like some, some work you just have to put into actually realizing what's going on, but then uh, taking these innovations and you basically outsource a lot of development uh, and that's, that's nice, I would say, and that's, as I said, also true for other companies that actually license the weights from us. Um, and uh, I think that's also a differentiation in the sense that there's not too many companies that are actually doing this. There's, yeah. there's, there's Mistral uh, in the language model domain. We're trying this, uh, put out Pixtral, I think, very recently. Uh, yeah, uh, very, and very curious. And you just released on, on, on the Mistral platform. That's right, yeah, we just, yeah. Uh, on Monday, we launched a partnership. Exactly, which is, which is, you know, I think takes us to the next place. But the pace at which you know, it's been a long time coming. You've been doing this for a number of years, but the pace at which the teams come together, you've shipped the first model, you've effectively beaten the state of the art, and now released, you know, with partners, with Mistral to build sort of this open source consortium, it's just been astonishing. We've spoken a lot about, you know, what you've done to date. Give us a flavor of what's to come. You've spoken about potentially doing video models, um, what's on the horizon for Black Forest? What should we be looking out for in the future? Yep. 
Actually, today uh, we, we're going to launch a few more tools around the image model. Um, and then, yeah, going beyond that, I think the main topics for the next few months so is like one is certainly video. Um, there's a few video models out there already. Some of them are quite good, um, but they are all kind of similar, I would say. So um, I, I think we really want to differentiate once we uh, go out with our approach, and that can either be like efficiency. Um, so achieving something like very fast video generation is. I think very interesting because it enables interactive applications. And we think about interactivity, that's also, for an image model, it's also very interesting because currently a lot of these workflows, they basically just um, include you type a text prompt, you generate an image, and then if you want to modify that image, you have to go back to the text prompt, and that's not ideal. And there's a lot of approaches being developed that then uh, actually enable you to. Um, modify the existing image or not go back to the text prompt. And I think building around that and making that like a very interactive and fast experience is super interesting for the future. And it's also like this means that this technology will be integrated into, or at least that's the hypothesis, right? But uh, that they really will be integrated into all um, workflows that include some kind of visual content. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, and by the way, encourage everybody to check out the release when it, when it comes through later today, um, you know, as you, as you think about, you know, the sort of role that you're starting to play here in Europe um, and, and in the open source community and releasing models like this, um, you know, how do you, what, what, is, what is your sort of call to action to, to European founders, European researchers that are putting out, you know, some of the best work out there? Um, first call is to just do stuff, I think. Um, don't, I don't know, just try it. Don't be like too uh, concerned about bureaucracy that might be involved. Uh, there's like, uh, you, you can get good help if you actually really want to. Um, but then the other part is I think there's a few very interesting companies in Europe right now. I mean, we have uh, Eleven Labs, we have Mistral um, on the like foundational model side. We're also on the foundational model side. We have a bunch of application com uh, companies and I think there's a real chance that this ecosystem now can develop. Um, and um, <coughs> uh, yeah, I think like one of the major challenges is, of course, like how does regulation around the AI and everything, how does it play out, how is it actually going to be implemented? Um, but I'm, I'm really hopeful that, I don't know, in a year we actually sit here and see major AI players having emerged from Europe. Well, we look forward to, you know, a panel next year with you, Arthur, and Matty from Eleven Labs. Hopefully, right. you know, sitting here as global winners in each of your respective categories. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, as, as, as we think about the next 12 months and even the next 24 months in Europe, you mentioned talent. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you've approached talent at Black Forest and how you can make this an example for you know, the rest of the rest of the European founders. Yeah, uh, it's a tricky question because uh, this knowledge is extremely specialized. Um, you have to acknowledge this. Um, and then if you if you really want to get like talent that is good right now, there's kind of limited possibilities where you can look. Right? There's obviously the universities, but then. Um, Within Europe, there's a few very, very good people, but I would say this like the existing pool is, is somewhat restricted. And of course, there's the Bay Area, San Francisco, U.S. Uh, having um, admittedly a, a larger ecosystem there. So I was, what, what, what it means for us is, on the one hand, we have to hire globally, especially in the areas where we need deep expertise, and that's something that we offer the company. It's just like a hybrid setup. Um, we fly in people regularly to, into our headquarter, um, but um, yeah, we really want to enable like hybrid work here, and we'll probably do like a few hubs. One of them will be in San Francisco as well. Um, and, and yeah, but then I think the other option that you have is really trying to get talent very early, so that means that you have, have to invest a little bit into basically uh, teaching or offering something like an internship. Or yeah, for the next, it, it, it the next generation. That's right, and it actually, 
it has been working out quite well. Like one of our founding team members, he has been joining us previously at another company through an internship, and uh, now he's like a super integ integral part of our team. And yeah, so that can work as well. It's just like if you're if you're under time pressure, um, you really have to commit doing that because it's, it obviously requires a little bit more of an investment. Super. Well, Robin, thank you so much. I think that's a message of hope for the European ecosystem. We have the talent. You know, we now have the capital. Um, we're leaders in you know, three of the main modalities. So hopefully the best is yet to come. Let's hope. Yeah, fingers crossed. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.